four things together, the opposites together, um, make up what's called these amino acids. There are 22 amino acids that form the genes that make up you and I. You and, I. and so we're here we have something, the 10 kings that are mingled with the 22 amino acids in our DNA. That's what the tree of life represents. And in the Kabbalah, this joining together of the 10 kings with the 22 amino acids invokes what they call the 72 names of God. Now, I didn't know that God had 72 names. Uh, I, I know one name of God. It's Jesus. It's the name above all names. But anyway, Kabbalah talks about this, and I'll, I'll explain that, how they get that. It's still kind of weird to me. Uh, but one of the things about the Kabbalah is they, from their, from, from their mystical writing called the Zohar, there are 72 rungs in Jacob's ladder. Now, you remember that Jacob's ladder has everything to do with the spiral ladder, the spiral staircase that's in the Masonic Temple. It is DNA. This, uh, Jacob's ladder is DNA. And uh, they say that there are 72 rungs on this. So when they talk about that, they talk about the elevation of mankind into godhood. Adam Kadmon is what they call it. The transhuman uh, man rising up above himself. Lucifer says 46 words to Eve in the Garden of Eden. He says, ye shall be as Gods. The elevation of mankind to gods is what the 72 names is all about. Now, the 72 names of God, they say, is taken from a specific place in the scriptures, Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 21. They're talking about the Hebrew letters uh, that are in those three verses there. The Zohar teaches that Moses gave the Israelites, in this passage, 72 names of angels that gave them the singularity of mind. Now, I'm going to stop right here. That singularity of mind is exactly, it's exactly what Dan Brown was talking about here in the lost symbol. He was referring to noetic science, where if everybody just groups their mind together, sort of like Vulcans on Star Trek, have this big mind meld, if everybody groups their minds together and thinks the same positive thoughts, then they will create something. They'll bring in a new age or a new world order of enlightenment. And so the Zohar teaches that Moses taught the Israelites when they were trapped near, near to the Red Sea that the story goes that they, Moses talked them all into walking into the Red Sea, like up to their necks. And then he taught them the 72 names of these angels. Here's your clue here. These 72 names of angels, and they thought this singular thought, and with their thoughts, the power of their thoughts, they themselves opened up the Red Sea. Literally, literally, they opened up a portal to the other side. I want you to get that. Now, the Bible teaches us that the Red Sea crossing... In fact, let me read this scripture here. Uh, Exodus 14, verse 19. The angel of God, uh, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came to pass... Uh, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians... In the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud of dark and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to thee, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and, and the waters were divided. Now that is the that's the King James translation. That's the King James version. The Kabbalists say that the Hebrew letters that are in that, in the original Hebrew, that if they're arranged in a certain way and spoken out loud, you're actually speaking 72 angels' names, which will then invoke the power of God to bring in this new age of enlightenment or bring man to godhood. Now, uh, let me pull this graphic up here so I make sure I pronounce this right. I told you that Kabbalah is really, really, it's really stupid. It's really complicated uh, because the Bible never mentions anything about that whatsoever. But anyway, this is called the 72 names of, the, of these angels that once they're pronounced right and invoked and man becomes God is known as the Shemham Forash. I don't think I'm pronouncing that quite the way the Hebrew would pronounce it. But it's referred to as the Shemham Forash. This is, in, in the, the original Hebrew, the word Shem, I do know that it means name. 
The original Hebrew basically says that it's the explicit name of God or the ineffable name of God. Manly Hall and Albert Pike talk about that a lot. The, the tetragrammaton, the yod heh vah if you say it right, then you invoke the power of God. This is witchcraft, uh, but the relation to the tetragrammaton is there. The Shem Ham Forash is basically a word that says we're invoking the power of God. Now, you need to understand what God they're referring to. And I came across a clip, and I, I appreciate uh, uh, Chris Pinto, uh, who I met in South Carolina back in January. Great guy. And he's a great documentary film producer. If you get a chance to get Chris Pinto's videos, get them. Uh, but I saw this clip on one of his videos, and I'm borrowing it from him. Chris, I hope you don't mind. Uh, but this is, remember we were talking about Anton LaVey, satanic, the, the author of the Satanic Bible. Here is a clip of him actually using the phrase Shem Ham Forash as a way to invoke Lucifer. Listen to it. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Shem Ham Forash. Shem Ham Forash. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. <laughs> This, this guy's just scary anyway. You know, with his bald head and his goatee. You know, I don't know if there's anything to it. But I see an awful lot of preachers nowadays shaving their head bald and growing a goatee. I don't know. I do know a lot of these preachers are walking away from this Bible. Now, I'm not saying that if you see a preacher and he's got a bald head and his goatee, that he is like worshiping the devil in private in his office. I'm not saying that. Just saying. Anyway, it is an invocation of Lucifer. Now, I want you to think about this because both of these earthquakes centered upon longitude 72, the second, 72nd meridian. We talked last week in the last broadcast about the symbolism of the 46 and DNA and all this stuff. And now we're looking at a different aspect of the same thing. And I've, I've, had, I've looked at some information on HARP this week. I've looked at information on scalar waves. Uh, scalar waves are, is this idea that this is science that says that we're able to, with these waves that we never even knew existed, remember waves, that we're able to cause earthquakes and so on and so on. Maybe, maybe the technology does exist by way of familiar spirit inspiration to cause this event to take place. I don't discount it. But I will tell you that in order to really believe in a true conspiracy, you have to understand that spirits, familiar spirits, are the ones involved in this, and they're the ones that have been leading the charge. Here's another instance of the number 72. You've heard of the Sistine Chapel. Here's an image of it in, uh, of it in here. Uh, you have 36 columns that support the Sistine Chapel in the ceiling. On those columns are 72 angels or 72 cherubims on 36 columns, two on each column. And they're opposites. That shows duality. Remember balance. North and south, as above, so below. Left and right, fused together on the same column. That makes exactly 72 angels or 72 cherubims. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the focal point of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is God. You've seen this imagery before. God giving enlightenment to mankind. And oh, by the way, here we have God with his arm stretched out to man, giving him illumination like E.T., you know. But here we have God.